Okay. Afternoon, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I'm John Turo. I'm a principal product manager within AWS, and I look after this new product, Greengrass, that we announced just a couple of hours ago. And I'll start with uh, a joke. Maybe, so maybe some of you have seen this one. This is The Office. The inimitable Michael Scott says, you know, we can't underestimate, overestimate the value of computers. They're great for playing games and forwarding funny emails, but real business is done on paper. And I think this is funny. And I also think it's a little bit profound. Because from the perspective of this guy who's a paper salesman, the world looks a certain way. And it's a reminder to me that we can all get caught in our own perspective. We can all get caught in thinking about the world a certain way. But as AWS, we're pretty lucky because we have all of you who are some of the best customers with some of the best problems. And that means we learn things that challenge us. And so here we are at a cloud conference, at an IoT mini conference within that cloud conference. And we're faced by something that's actually very challenging to the model that we've had in the past, which is that of all these devices out in the world, and we've talked about, you know, 10 billion, 30 billion, 50 billion, generating all this data. The vast majority of that data is never going to hit the cloud where we can add value to it. And you can think of all kinds of examples. In the medical scenario, you can think about regulatory restrictions on where that personal sensitive information can actually go. If you're thinking about heavy machinery, like a mining vehicle or a car, the time to make a decision may not allow for round trip latency to the cloud because of the safety implications of moving something really big and heavy or a vehicle moving really fast and maybe avoiding a crash or making a turn. And if you think about really extreme operating environments where you want to have devices act intelligently, the round trip latency and the expense of moving all those bits back and forth can get prohibitive. And you know, we can't actually rely on technology improving over time to solve this problem. We can't rely on Moore's law or, or uh, trends like that because we see three, what we call them, three laws that actually tell us these problems are not going away. And first we'll talk about the law of physics that says light moves only so fast. And if I'm a vehicle that's about to hit another vehicle or a wall or, or spin off the road, I don't have time to wait for a signal to bounce off the cloud. And even if you tell me that round trip latency got 10x better, I still can't afford it. And if that vehicle drives into a tunnel and loses its connectivity, no intelligent code that lives on the device or in the cloud can actually fix that connection issue until it gets resolved physically. Physics, not going away. Second is the law of economics, which tells us Moving bits around has a certain cost. And if I want to get the vast majority of bits off of my device into the cloud, I'm going to have to pay for that before I even know how valuable they are. And that becomes prohibitive in a lot of use cases, especially as the devices that operate in the world generate more and more data. And finally, we talk about the law of the land, which can be a real law, regulation, regulatory or legal restrictions on where the bits can go, they can't leave my country, they can't leave my hospital or my factory. They can also be privacy or security concerns that tell me my policy is to not move those bits outside of my premises where I can physically control them. And so maybe some of you had a chance to join the IoT State of the Union just about an hour ago. And that's where we talked about the IoT cloud platform that we launched last year that makes it easy to connect devices to the cloud, connect cloud applications back to those devices, and add value to those data. Really powerful features that we've seen customers start to do wonderful things with, like a gateway for maintaining long-lived connections with billions of devices and trillions of messages, a rules engine for processing those messages on the fly, Security that accommodates the supply chain and the operating constraints of connected devices. And a construct called the device shadow, which creates a real uh, logical 
alter ego to a real device out there in the world. So that was last year. This year, we're taking the advice and the challenges that you all have brought to us about how to take devices that are subject to the three laws, and we've introduced something called AWS Greengrass. And Greengrass is software that extends AWS onto your devices, pieces of AWS IoT and Lambda. So the devices connect locally on the data they generate and still take advantage of the cloud opportunistically as they're able to connect. Now, I hope as we're sitting here today and as we all have a chance to talk, that you all are starting to think about how you can take advantage of this. And the mental model that, that other customers of ours have already found helpful is the, is the metaphor of a head and a body. Where the head is really important, that's where our long-term thinking happens. That's where our strategic thinking happens. That's where our memory happens. But musicians and artists and experts and anyone who can touch type will use the term muscle memory and talk about reflexes, sense of touch. And so with Greengrass, you can actually follow that metaphor to say, the cloud can be the head of my IoT solution. And with Greengrass, my devices out in the world, be they big or small, could be arms and legs and joints. And these can all work together as one. So extending the metaphor that we showed before, here's Greengrass. That offers Lambda execution together with important pieces of AWS IoT. PubSub messaging, local security, and stateful device shadows. We'll talk a lot more about each of these. Four benefits have started to bubble up. The first is that your devices out in the world can respond to local events quickly without need of transit latency, based on business rules that you've defined as Lambda functions and deployed down. Depending on where in the world that may be, that's gonna be faster or slower response time that you're bypassing. But even in a fairly well-connected environment, you're gonna to start to notice differences and be able to take advantage of that in the assumptions you can make about how your devices are supposed to Next, we'll talk about the ability to operate offline, where devices that are subject to spotty or expensive connectivity can keep working, can keep behaving as expected, even if they lose that connection to the cloud. And if necessary, they can buffer and spool messages that are outbound so that when they reconnect, they can sync. Third, we'll talk about the simplified device programming model that Lambda offers that lets you write Python functions in the cloud and deploy them down to your devices, taking native advantage of the inputs from sensors and the output to actuators. With that Lambda code and using a modern API-based deployment and workflow for doing all that. And finally, you can reduce the cost of an IoT application by pre-processing and filtering all the data that your device is going to emit and sending a smaller volume of higher value data up to the cloud. Now, we're really excited about some of the early response that we've gotten to Greengrass. And today, we're happy to share that we already have some partners and some customers who are ready to talk about that. First partners, we'll talk about Intel and Qualcomm and Amazon's own Annapurna, who are working to extend Greengrass so that it can take advantage of the differentiated capabilities of their silicon and help their own customers build devices with Greengrass baked right in. And we'll talk about Canonical, who build the powerful Ubuntu distribution of Linux, which is one of the Linux distributions that we've already tested with Greengrass. And not only are we working with Canonical to make sure Greengrass runs great on Ubuntu, but we'll make it easy to get Greengrass onto your Ubuntu-powered devices through the Snap Store. And we're looking forward to that ecosystem growing even faster to support mutual customers as they start to build devices powered by Greengrass. 
Now on the customer side, you're going to hear from some of our customers here at reInvent who, actually talk, who will actually be able to talk about what it is that they've started to build with Greengrass. Technicolor is here, and they'll talk about how they are building on their position as the number one provider of home gateways in the world to make a next generation that is even smarter with Greengrass and can get smarter over time by deploying new functionality faster than ever. I hope you'll have a chance to check out the JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab session that's happening later today at reInvent, where we're actually going to demonstrate a small version of the Mars rover that has been adapted to run Greengrass so that it can operate with in some of the extreme environments that you might imagine JPL robots are expected to operate. And we'll even talk about AWS Snowball, the, the Snowball Edge product that just was announced today that has processing capabilities baked right in. And in fact, Snowball is going to be the first device that ships that has green grass in it. You can start getting those on Monday. Really excited. We're also excited that we've been able to price green grass in such a way that we hope it's cheap enough for virtually every use case you might like to use it for. And even more importantly, with Greengrass, we follow the AWS tenet that you pay only for what you use. So we don't want to charge you for devices that are offline sitting on a shelf in a warehouse. We don't want to charge you for executing code on your own device. We don't want to charge you for devices that are sitting on a submarine and never talk to us. And so Greengrass is priced on the basis of active devices, active Greengrass core, which is the term we're going to talk about in a minute. And active means the device wakes up and talks to our cloud backend at least once during the space of a month. So we'll be talking a lot about all the ways you can use Greengrass. And the message of our pricing, we hope, is that everybody can use it. And in fact, we help you get started by offering a free tier of three devices, uh, three active monthly devices for the first year that everybody can use to get started with Greengrass. So that's the why of Greengrass. Now I'll talk a little bit about what it is, and after that, how it works. So as I said, Greengrass is software that you put on your own devices or devices that you get from a partner. It's not hardware. And it has two pieces of software in it. The first is Greengrass Core, which is the primary runtime. And the second is the IoT device SDK, which is an enhancement to the SDK we launched last year. And that SDK lets devices connect over the local network to Greengrass Core and take advantage of its capabilities. Greengrass Core is the thing that you're going to put on your devices to make them enabled with Greengrass. It includes an execution environment for Lambda functions, an MQTT pub sub broker, persistence for and sync for device shadows, and local security. And we've designed it so that it can pack down really small, because we want to fit into as wide a set of heterogeneous environments as we can. So Greengrass can run in something as small as a Raspberry Pi or an Edison, a single core processor at 1 gigahertz with 128 megabytes of RAM. Some of these devices are less than $20. You can use x86 or ARM architecture. And we've tested it on two distributions of Linux. And there, there are going to be lots more that will just work. It's important to know, though, that when we talk small, we don't mean that's a ceiling. It's only a floor. And we don't see a ceiling. The sky is the limit in terms of what resources Greengrass can take advantage of. If you throw more CPU and memory and storage and peripherals and sensors at Greengrass, you can take advantage of that in the architecture that you build. And in fact, the real resource requirements are going to be determined by what it is that you'd like to do. So that's Greengrass Core, and it's the primary runtime. The other major piece of software that we're going to provide with Greengrass is an enhancement to our existing IoT device SDK. 
And if you remember, last year we announced the IoT device SDK that makes it easy to connect devices up to AWS in the cloud and sync device shadows and handle certificate-based authentication. And so now, that same SDK makes it possible to authenticate locally to Greengrass and participate in a defined group and exchange messages. So that means you can actually create this local distributed system, if you will, a hub and spokes. And like Greengrass Core, devices that use the device SDK can be really big. They can be a server appliance. They can be one of those mining vehicles the size of a house that was shown in the IoT State of the Union. The device SDK can also pack down really small microcontroller-based devices. So long as they support the language of the SDK that you choose, can now talk to Greengrass. And that means they can actually take advantage of the resources on whatever device is running Greengrass Core. Think of a, a tiny button or a switch that invokes a Lambda function on a more capable device on the same local network. And you can start to imagine wonderful things. As part of the model of how Greengrass works, we ask you to define a group of Greengrass core and devices that are allowed to work together. And you, config, you configure that and push the configuration down to your Greengrass core as a deployment. And that means the core and its devices can communicate to each other, and the devices can also communicate via the core. And that works without needing to connect to the cloud for daily operation. Those devices can run for long periods of time, and we expect some of them will connect for very long periods of time without wide area network connectivity resuming. At the same time, if cloud connectivity does become available, you can start to channel messages through the Greengrass core up to the cloud, either into the IoT rules engine or directly into another AWS service, whatever is the most appropriate thing for your use case. So that's Greengrass core and device SDK and groups of cores and other devices working together with Greengrass, and that's what it is. Now let's talk about what it does. The first feature that we mentioned is this construct of a Lambda function. And for those of you who need the refresher, Lambda functions are event-based compute functions. You might think of them as compute floating in space the way our S3 object storage has storage bits floating in space. And they can be invoked by any event that you choose to send them. And you don't need to manage and scale the Lambda functions. Instead, they just run as many times as you invoke them. And we think of this as the killer application for IoT because, as many of you in the room know, IoT devices like to communicate with a minimum of context and a minimum of wasted bandwidth and battery and compute and invoke whatever is the, the expected execution in the cloud based on context. And so one of the really powerful features of Greengrass is that we take that same Lambda execution model and let it float down to your devices themselves, where the Lambda functions can now not just be invoked, but actually can run. And so with Greengrass, you can take functions that are written in Python, eventually we'll have more languages too, and you can invoke them based on local, mes local messaging and shadows. Local messaging can be generated by digital inputs or even analog inputs against your devices. And as we'll discuss, shadows are nothing more than a, a JSON document that describes the state of your device and syncs it to the cloud. But changes in that state or desired state can in turn generate messages which invoke lambdas. And so you start to get a very flexible programming model that lets you describe lots of scenarios of when you'd like code to get executed and how you'd like it to be executed. Some of the use cases that we've started to see for lambdas already have been one, making my devices do stuff, command and control. Second, 
falling back from the cloud if connectivity is not available. Third, pre-processing or filtering and aggregation. This is worth a pause. Think about a device that generates 10,000, 20,000 sensor readings per second. And many of those readings may be duplicative. Many of them may be uninteresting. But I don't actually know what are the interesting subsets of that data. So with Lambda on my local device, I can start to process those messages on the fly. I can identify anomalies. I can take averages. I can draw summary statistics. And I can upload only those interesting subsets of my data to the cloud where other devices across my fleet can benefit from them. Pre-processing. The third is through, uh, the, sorry, the fourth feature that we've started to think about is iterative learning. Because just as Lambda functions can dictate the intelligence in my device, deploying new Lambda functions and updates to my Lambda functions therefore means the devices can get smarter over time. And in a world where it was a pain in the neck to push new functionality down to my device, I don't do it too often. And by contrast, if it becomes easy with Greengrass to push new functionality down to my device, maybe I'll do it more. Maybe I can start to experiment more and become more agile. That's Lambda. The next feature that we've added to Greengrass is the device shadow, which is a concept we introduced a year ago. And a device shadow operationally is nothing more than a JSON document, a text file that's structured and represents the state of a device, its last reported state and its desired future state. We call them device shadows. Sometimes we use the word thing. And we're intentionally vague because we, we ask our customers to define the structure of their shadows however is most logical to them. And one shadow might be a car or the dashboard on a car, or a Lambda function on a car, or a fleet of vehicles. And with this construct, you can start to track the state of your various assets. And you can also sync that between local and cloud so that you have the, call it the last available source of truth. And you can refer to that programmatically via API. And you can also refer to it via the messaging system on Greengrass and AWS IoT so that you can, re you can respond to changes in the reported or desired state. Now, in addition to the state of the device or the Lambda function itself, you may use device shadows for, call it deep state or granular state, information that's not typically interesting to you in the cloud, but may be interesting for your functions to operate against. And it may be interesting for you to pull back to the cloud in a debug scenario if you'd like to learn more. And so with Greengrass, we've made it possible to, to keep those shadows local and manipulate the flag that tells the shadow to start syncing up. You can also use shadows for lightweight configuration of the Lambda functions that are pushed down to your device. And because a shadow is even easier and more lightweight to update versus the Lambda function itself, you can start to adjust that configuration almost continuously and start to add really fine grain tuning to the way your devices behave. So that's device shadows, and it works really well together with Lambda functions. The third major feature I'll talk about is messaging which is the glue that lets devices and Lambda functions and sensors and actuators interact within Greengrass. And just as we do in the cloud with AWS IoT, Greengrass offers a PubSub messaging system that uses the lightweight MQTT protocol that is designed to work really well in extreme operating environments. And on Greengrass, you define the subscribers and the publishers in a delimited way so that malicious devices can't actually participate in that group. And you define what are going to be the interactions and the triggers of your Lambda functions. And you can start to get 
really precise about which subsets of your data should be treated in what fashion by applying standard MQTT topic filters. So you can actually say this subset of the data, this data from one sensor with one type of flag should be processed in this fashion. Finally, I'll talk about security, which, as you all know, is very important. And what we've tried to do with Greengrass is bring the same standard of security as much as possible out to our customers' own devices. And we do that in a few ways. First, by insisting that all devices that interact locally within a Greengrass group mutually authenticate one another, that one another are genuine, just as Greengrass Core mutually authenticates with the cloud. And that means bad actors aren't able to message with Greengrass devices, aren't able to participate in your group, even if they share the same local network. In addition, we take this mutual authentication that works between Greengrass devices and between Greengrass and the Greengrass back end, and we pair that to the traditional IAM SIGV4 credentials that make it possible to interact with any other AWS service. And so in this way, the Lambda functions on your device can talk to DynamoDB, Kinesis, S3, new machine learning services that we announced today, and so forth. So that's a bit about why we're building Greengrass and what it is and what it does. And as I said, we'd really like for everyone here to think about what it is that you can do with all this. So what I'd like to do now is introduce Brett Francis, who's a, a principal solution architect with AWS, who's going to show you something that he's actually built on Greengrass that you can learn about and then go see in the Dev Lounge. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Brett. Hello, everyone. So uh, yesterday at the cocktail hour, I don't know if any of you came by, but in the developer lounge, there were two robot arms that were sharing a box back and forth across a conveyor belt. So um, what that was, was, as I mentioned, a fulfillment center demo. So we've talked to our fulfillment center people who do automation. Um, I don't know if you know, but sometimes when you buy two boxes from Amazon, they might be in two different fulfillment centers. It's actually cheaper to send a box from one to the other before it goes to you. So there's these sorting arms that uh, exist. Sometimes they're human, sometimes they're robotic. A box shows up out of a truck, comes off a conveyor belt, it's picked up, it's placed onto another conveyor belt that then goes to another arm that then puts it into inventory for eventual shipping in the reverse process. So that demo, we tried to shrink down to a table size and then bring it here to the show. Uh, and inside it, it has green grass. So this is the, sh the demo, you'll see if you go there. Uh, the box is moving on the conveyor belt. It's gonna be picked up by the robot arm on the right, handed back. If you notice, the conveyor belt actually changed direction. I'll get into that in a second. Um, give it a second here, see what goes on. People start rooting for the arm that's their favorite. Uh, this one, oh, it missed, oh no. But since it's all local, it actually looks and says, ah, it recovers, it goes back, and it picks it up again, and puts it back. So if you notice, now each of these independent pieces are making some decisions. Um, each arm is deciding if it sees a box, if it picks up a box, and then where to put it. That's all it really knows. It's then sharing its information locally on a MQTT mesh that is set up with anything else that's uh, secure and authenticated to listen to that mesh. And then the conveyor belt is listening to that mesh for a very simple message of an arm found a box. And the conveyor belt has one job, move away from the arm that found the box. Then the other arm sits there and waits for the box to show up. So um, when it arrives, then it does its thing. It just goes back and forth. It's very, very mesmerizing, actually. Um, it's like water. Um, but the interesting thing about that is at its core, it's a very simple, very simple problem, and we were able to model it in some very simple approach. But at its core, it's still a very highly decoupled and microservices architecture. So we're gonna get into that in a bit. 
But what's kind of cool about that is that's the same way we develop when we're on the cloud, right? If you have very complex systems, we tend to decompose them into smaller pieces that then with orchestration of either some messaging layer or an orchestration layer become uh, emergent in their overall solution behavior. So now you can do that in your devices, local, that's all on a local hub. There's no intelligence going back and forth to the cloud in that picture. So what does the architecture look like? This is what it looks like in one way. Um, if you're familiar with our architecture diagrams, they're isometric. So in the left is the sorting host. So this is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's running a green grass core on it. It has, so the green are where the local lambdas are running in the core. The yellow is where the device logic is. So this device uh, on this one is talking to the sorting arm at 20 cycles a second. It's doing two things. Uh, it's getting the telemetry from all the servos that are there, the humidity, uh, not humidity, the uh, torque, the uh, position, the temperature, all the things that matter from an error detection perspective. And then it's also controlling it. It's sending commands to that at any point in time. And that's happening all with a green grass device. So that's using, this is all IoT, uh, Python SDK. So that's using Python to do that interaction over the protocol uh, with that device. Then that device, the little yellow one that's in there, is communicating with the core to then, the core is looking at the messages coming from that device and making decisions about what to do. Should I go into find mode? Should I go into pickup mode? Should I go into sort mode? When I go into these modes, who do I advertise to? Which topics do I publish to? So each so, uh, the sorting host then just publishes to local messages. So then we get to what I call the master host. So this is a separate host with a separate core and a separate Raspberry Pi that also is locally doing one job, and that's what I mentioned, managing the conveyor belt. So there's a servo that all it does is choose one way or another. That two is being sampled at 20, sam 20 samples a second, just for consistency, and uh, that information is flowing into the core. But this core also has some other local devices that their job is very simple. All it does is they bridge across cores to bring messages across in a fabric so that there's local logic that there's, uh, think of it as uh, we mentioned like the knee and the head. There's local logic even on the master host that knows how to control the belt. But then we have a higher order lambda function that is doing more complex logic and shadow state updates to represent the whole state of all three stations, even though it's not actually talking to those other ones. It's just getting messages from them. So that's what's going on in the middle. And in the inventory arm, the same thing is taking place, just kind of in reverse to what the sorting arm is doing. It's looking for boxes, sampling at 20 cycles a second, making some error detection decisions as well. So all of these, th these three things then result in a mesh of MQTT messages that are flying at around at about 60 cycles a second um, for, so that everything there is available, uh, the state and the visibility of what is happening now is always available to all the things that need it, but then you can also ignore it if you don't care. So each of these, most of them don't care, most of those messages are irrelevant, but none of those messages are actually going up to the cloud. So at 60 cycles a second for intelligence locally, where you can do independent and coordinated actions, but none of that has to flow up to the cloud. So we're not incurring any of that cost of interacting with the cloud itself. So then you get to how did Greengrass actually help us in this? So Greengrass was fundamental for, actually let me go back a picture. So in the master host is where I mentioned quickly that we have a shadow. So that shadow is where the state representation of what each arm is doing is stored. It knows uh, this arm is in find mode, this arm is not. It also is where, if you notice, there's a reference to buttons. Uh, it knows which button is pushed to control it. It's another classic uh, little thing. If you've got a Raspberry Pi, there's a GPIO port that you can control with little analog switches. So it has some buttons that it's able to understand the state of those. So when people push start, it starts. When they push stop, it stops. But that state of what should everything be doing is stored in that shadow in that central place. The other hosts then are doing their high frequency samples for local visibility. They're not actually storing their own states. So each arm doesn't know its state at any moment in time. It just spews what's going on. And there's a lambda there that's watching the telemetry to decide, do I see an error in the telemetry? Is, has something become over-torqued? 
is there too much temperature on one of the servos? And that visibility is happening locally in each of those stations. What this got us to do was, uh, well, can we go even faster, right? Can we detect things sooner and sooner and sooner? And what we found was, you know, interesting enough, when, when you try to bring this, uh, these cloud models out into the meat space that we all live in, um, the communication was starting to be limited by how the physical transport we could do. So it's an older serial protocol, so we could really only do about 20 cycles a second to get the information from the servos. So it was kind of cool because we could go, in fact, I was running at eight kilohertz for a while and the servos were just losing their minds, but um, it was just fun. So, um, but even when we're sampling at that rate, that flurry of messaging that's going on, the fact that it's all happening over an MQTT message transport and MQTT routers allows each of these to also just stay decoupled. So since neither of them knows of each other, they're just doing their little job, it actually is easier to develop for because you have these bright lines between these areas. So it was able to communicate with others and other developers I might have wanted to work with as well. So all the kind of benefits you're used to in a decoupled microservices architecture. And then we started over the course of the project thinking of this really, who knows anything about octopuses? No, not a big octopus crowd. Um, so octopuses actually have brains in their head and brains in their limbs. So each brain in the limb has a local job and it can reach on its own. It can actually attack prey, it can do some of these other kind of things. But then the brain that's in its head coordinates overall action of when the octopus wants to leave a location or maybe build something with multiple limbs together. So these independent brains can perform higher and lower level actions that are necessary for the life, in our case, of the solution, but in that case, of the octopus. So we started thinking of how could we keep leveraging this because once you have a mesh where all this can work together, it's like, why not get it even further distributed where they can be even more independent? Because what if somebody unplugs something? This is a fulfillment center demo. That arm still better stop if somebody puts their hand in front of it if you're out there, right? So the security starts taking over, and that security as a primary need for high frequency sample rate is something we're really hoping to keep exploring with this demo, but at its core, that high frequency sample rate is now able to be done with cloud development approach that you're used to, but on premise. So it's kind of fun, uh, we just started thinking in that way. So um, with that, Actually, I'm going to hand it over to Bart. He's going to talk to you uh, about uh, how Technicolor is doing some interesting things with Greengrass as well. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to, to present here. Um, my name is Bart Verkam, and I'm, uh, I'm responsible for product management for broadband inside Technicolor Connected Home. And I'm going to shed you some light on, on how we use Greengrass to make our gateways uh, smarter. Um, but let me first uh, give you a bit of an introduction to Technicolor and its market. Uh, most of you that might have heard of Technicolor must be thinking probably about movies. Uh, this is our content creation business uh, where we do, for instance, the special effects of a lot of movies and commercials that you, that you see around you. But today I'm going to be talking more about our content distribution and more particularly about our home gateways that we uh, are marketing to, through internet service providers around the globe. We are the number one market leader uh, for, for, for home gateways and we shipped around 500 million units uh, to date of that. Um, together with our internet service providers, we're currently, and with our customers, we're currently see seeking for novel ways uh, to make better use of that unique position that those broadband gateways have inside their homes. And that is why we're so excited uh, for the opportunities that Greengrass brings us. Today in the, in the IoT State of the Union, uh, we basically announced three products. The first product is a, a new, brand new 10 gig broadband gateway. Uh, it's a very powerful device that is based on the Annapur Amazon Annapurna chipset. Uh, it's very powerful so that it can run, route 10 gigabits per second in the WAN and LAN and also on the Wi-Fi. It has IoT embedded and is a full carrier gate platform, which means that it's, uh, it fulfills all the requirements of our service providers. As you can see, it looks great. Uh, but last but not least, it embeds Greengrass, which really makes it a full service platform, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. The second product we're announcing today is our uh, tri-band new Wi-Fi extender. For us, it embodies a very cool and incredibly cool way to give you the best Wi-Fi coverage throughout the home. Um, 
Through Greengrass, uh, it runs a number of Wi-Fi diagnostic tools that make sure that every device in the home um, gets the best out of their device and out of the best Wi-Fi service it can get inside the home. Um, it looks cool, so I think we will be we're very convinced that uh, a lot of people will want this in their home and will be very proud of it. Third, but not least, we're launching as well a personal assistant. Both of these products, the Gateway and the Extender, they have Alexa embedded and they come with a set of technical skills for the connected home. Those skills, some of those skills use green grass for, for two use cases, mainly for now, which is one is a, a better installation experience when you get the box at home and install it. And a second one is a help desk optimization service that will simplify A, the diagnostics and B, the troubleshooting for both the consumers and for the internet service providers. But now let's first get into a bit of more detail on why we were using green grass in the first place to, for our new devices. If you look at the gateway market, uh, it's not a new paradigm to make it a full service platform. It has always been an idea, but green grass solves a number of issues uh, that are there and helps us to overcome them and, and come with solutions today. The first one is, is that gateways typically have a very monolithic firmware. Although technically it's possible to upgrade features at runtime, it's typically very cumbersome both for us and for our customers to do this. Thanks to the lambdas and containers in Greengrass, this allows us to have a life cycle of new services that is different from that one in the operational firmware. And that gives a number of benefits. First of all, it gives a fast time to market uh, for those new services, which is a real benefit. Second of all, it, it reduces the cost for a deploying and maintaining those, those services when they are deployed. And last but not least, it gives a more robustness and a better security for those services as well. A second problem uh, that is often there, doing things in the cloud costs money. Although some of you might think that it makes sense to put everything in the cloud, it often isn't. There are some things that make more sense local. Thanks to the edge computing green grass, it allows us to make the most out of the capabilities of that gateway and the processing power. And that gives us a benefit for A, reducing the cost, but also the latency of the things that, that, and that we interact with so that it goes much faster. And on top, and last but not least, it gives you better rights for privacy. I think John referred to that already. Some regulatory things don't allow certain data, especially from consumers, to go to the cloud. So we allow them to be treated at home. A third problem that we often have with gateways is that it's an embedded device. And embedded software skills have typically a steep learning curve ahead of them which means that often this puts a constraint on open software ecosystems and open software developer communities to be available for those devices. Greengrass brings us the cloud development model inside those gateways, allowing it to have access to the developer community, of which many of you are in the room here today, to bring those new services to the gateway. All this, this together allows us and our customers a better flexibility to decide when to deploy new services, where to deploy them, and how to deploy them. So that gives a lot of better flexibility. So that gives us a bit of more view on the architecture of how service providers are using all those services in an architecture. So today, you have gateways and typically a number of Wi-Fi extenders in the home that get access to the internet, basically to the ISP's access network and its core network. Then today, both Technicolor is using AWS to run a number of services that interact with the gateway, but also a lot of our ISP customers are using AWS already to run these items. Thanks to Greengrass, Greengrass allows us to bring a number of these Lambda functions that both either the ISPs or we have written to bring them to the gateway to allow for better and for new services to be deployed. By adding on top the IoT SDK into the Wi-Fi extenders, as we, as we just announced, this allows those devices to talk to each other and to allow to more distributed services. Furthermore, thanks to this, it allows as well that we allow third parties in their verticals to deliver devices on their way to the home and deliver those services to the subscribers. Either those devices are IoT devices that are directly connected to the new gateway thanks to the IoT radios like Zigbee or something, or it can be IP-enabled devices that when they embed the IoT SDK, they can communicate with this edge group and, and, and make use of these new services. Let's now dive a little bit deeper in the services that I just 
talked about from the personal assistant and how they flow inside the, the complete AWS architecture. So the personal assistant has a number of services. One of them is, for instance, uh, unboxing the hardware and helping them, the end user to install it. It helps you to set up a guest network of Wi-Fi and it gives you a help desk optimization service. These services make use of a number of components and software that are either, either run in the cloud on the left side or on the edge on the right side. So on the right side, you see the two new devices we announced, the gateway and the extender. Both are running the operational software. We call it in technical or homeware that is running on top of them. These embed a number of the AWS IoT functionalities. On the gateway, we have the green grass core running, which allow to run a number of lambdas locally there. And on the extender, on the right side, we have the, as the IoT SDK running. They both are combined into a green grass edge group, which allows them to commu communicate with each other. Then, for instance, for the diagnostic service, we have a, locally a diagnostic Lambda running that collects diagnostic data both from the extender, the connected home, and, in, and from the gateway. And this data is sent up to the cloud towards the, towards the IoT service, where it's then being calculated and processed and put into a relational database. We also have a Lambda for the diagnostics running in the cloud to do further processing of this data and publish it into S3 and to the Dynamo database. We also have another Lambda running in the cloud that does a dashboard function to publish for the internet service provider a number of dashboards so they can make use and see what's going on uh, at end of the home. On top, thanks to Alexa, we allow as well that through the Alexa skills that these diagnostic services can be invoked by the consumer. This gives us a benefit that it is a simple way so you can access these diagnostics and can even self-heal these problems at home. And next to that, for the guest network and for the unboxing, we have a number of, yet another number of local lambdas running on the right inside, inside the gateway. To conclude, I think Technicolor is very excited to work with Greengrass uh, uh, in his new products to enable a number of new products and services in the home and to unleash a number of new possibilities. For us, that brings a number of clear benefits, a faster time to market, uh, a reduced total cost of ownership for our customers and the consumer, an increased flexibility and as well privacy that is benefiting the consumer in the end. But even more, I think combining the power of the cloud and the edge together, it unleashes a new realm of possibilities and opportunities for developing new services that we even did not think of. And with that, a developer community that can help us make those uh, services real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. Really cool to see some of the early ideas that have already started to bubble up with green grass. And we're, we're thrilled to see what you all will come up with. Uh, there are just a, a few thoughts I wanted to leave you with, and then I'm, I'm happy to take questions. There's one thing you remember that we've all learned, we've learned from all of you, is that there are three reasons that the cloud isn't enough for IoT devices. Three laws that aren't going to change anytime soon. There's a law of physics, there's a law of economics, and there's a law of the land. And for that, we built Greengrass, which has four features. Greengrass has local execution of lambdas, local security, local messaging, and local device shadows. And this is important for the two types of developers who have to work together. And for these developers, the grass has always been greener on the other side, where embedded developers could touch the devices and could write embedded C or something even more exotic, but couldn't use modern programming languages, couldn't use modern workflows couldn't take advantage of machine learning in the cloud. And on the other side of that divide, cloud developers had all these great languages, all this great tooling, high-level applications, infinite compute and storage for just a couple percent of the total data generated out in the world. And so Greengrass is important because it, it brings these people together and it lets each embedded developers and cloud developers get the best of both worlds. We want to make sure that 
everyone can get started as fast as possible. So we've launched a limited preview today, and we're going to let folks in just as fast as we can. You can sign up at aws.amazon.com slash greengrass. And you can also already order the very first greengrass-powered device that will ship uh, within days, which is AWS Snowball Edge. And you can sign up for that as well. Thank you very much.